Good morning, Grace Church. Good to be with you again. Especially on this typhoon day, which is not a typhoon day because there's no typhoon, but glad that you can be here. Join us in this wonderful auditorium today. And uh, you in your auditorium, sitting on your nice sofa in your lounge or living room, and uh, joining in with us at Grace Church today. I want to speak to you today about training, being in spiritual training. And that has to do with what I would call hard body Christianity. While we meet today, even though we're scattered far away, this is called church. Church is not a building, it's not an institution, it's a living organism, and it's made of people. And Jesus is the one who calls us his body. So, as the body of Christ, how are we doing? I know that particularly during this last year or so, it's been very, very important to do a self-check to see what kind of health we're in, how we're living, whether or not we're keeping up our immune system and keeping... Uh, supposedly keeping our distances and so forth. That's been the hardest part to do because people are not made to do that. We're not made to live in isolation. But I want to speak today about our spiritual health, our spiritual conditioning. And if we are called the body of Christ, then the question we could ask ourselves is, how closely then do we resemble Jesus, who is God in human form? Would you say that Grace Church is emulating fitness, strength in spirit? Hard body Christianity refers to, or, or the hard body part, refers to the body of a person who is fit and in shape. Hard body Christians, then, are those who are building up the body of Christ. Paul speaks about this to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, building up the body. Then, as we saw last week in 1 Timothy, Paul was talking to his uh, young uh, mentor there, training for godliness. We're supposed to be training ourselves in godliness. And then we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, especially in verse 25, we're to exercise self-control. We're to exercise discipline. Now, as we come to chapter 9 of Luke today, this chapter speaks, first of all, about Jesus sending out his apostles. And they go into many villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Herod hears about the news, and he's very curious about this guy, Jesus. He says... <clears throat> Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. So the first kind of um, uh, follower might be somebody who's just simply curious. They're wondering, well, what is this? Who is this? What's this about? Something has caught his attention. Something catches the attention of other people. Sometimes churches are designed to draw people simply out of curiosity, to see what's going on in there. They're not really followers, not really seekers. They're merely interested and curious to know, which isn't a bad thing, because it gives a person an opportunity to at least hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, something that is important. But then when we come down to verse 18 in chapter 9, we read this. Now it happened... That is he, that's Jesus, was praying alone. The disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do crowds say that I am? Interesting question. Why is he asking that question? Because they have just seen an incredible miracle. In Luke chapter 9, <clears throat> Jesus has been preaching on a mount near the Sea of Galilee. There's Thousands of people who are there. We're told there's 5,000 men that are there, not including the rest of the families. And uh, you know the story about how the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, you should send them away so they can go find something to eat. There's no McDonald's around there. There's no Pian Dan around there. 
So what are they going to do? Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them. And again, the story goes that they find that a young boy has five loaves and two fishes. They give it to Jesus. Jesus prays and asks God's blessing about it. Then he begins to break it up. And the disciples distribute the food. And those 5,000 or more people who are there are fed until they're full and there are still leftovers. So when he's talking about <clears throat> who do the crowds say that I am, he's saying this. And they answered them, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. So they aren't, they're, they're understanding there's something unique, unusual, different about Jesus. And then Jesus says to them, chapter 9, verse 20, he says, Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. So first we have the curious. Now we have the convinced. Peter and the disciples, they're convinced. Something or some event has convinced them that Jesus is God. In my opinion, since this is placed right there, I think that they were fairly convinced when they saw how those five loaves and two fishes fed all those people and they still had leftover. You know something? <clears throat> I'm impressed. And I wasn't even there. That they see that there's this one is called Jesus is the Messiah. For some people, it takes a miracle. For some people, it takes some kind of deliverance. In other words, to be convinced, God unmistakably reveals himself. But the thing is about the convincing is this. Oftentimes, we want to be convinced over and over and over again that Jesus then needs to keep proving who he is to us. The majority of us who call ourselves Christians can be found in this group. Yeah, we're convinced. We're convinced that Jesus is God, but he needs to keep showing up. Then there's the third kind. There's the curious, the convinced, and now we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, about those who are the committed. These are the committed. Chapter 20, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says this, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So here's what Jesus is saying. These would have Jesus more than self, more than anything else in their life. Like John, the committed say, he must e increase, I must decrease. These committed Christians have tapped in to a deep desire for God. Ruth Haley Barton puts it like this. The depth of desire has a great deal to do with the outcome of our life. Often those who accomplish what they set out to do in life are not those who are the most talented or gifted or who have had the best opportunities. Often they are the ones who are most deeply in touch with how badly they want whatever they want. They are the ones who consistently refused to be deterred by the things that many of us allow to become excuses, allow them to take our attention away from what we're committed to. Jesus says, take up your cross, daily identify with his sacrifice. So we could say that the defining difference between the convinced and the committed is simply this. What do you want? What do you want? When we know what we want, and this is our deep desire, then that's what we're going to go for. You may know that uh, I have a son who is a Green Beret in the U.S. Army. Now, that's a highly specialized position. On the Disco Discovery Channel, the TV series entitled Surviving the Cut, it's about a selection process for choosing the elite of the elite. And by the way, if you allow me a bit of braggadociousness, my son graduated first in his class. I was very proud of him. But the purpose 
of this testing is to find out who has the commitment and the desire to make it through regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what they feel, regardless of their own uh, uh, pain and, and suffering. You see, the question is repeatedly screamed to the candidates as they're wallowing through the mud, doing push-ups after having hiked miles all day long with 50-pound packs. The, quest, quest, the question is this, how much do you want this? How much do you want this? What are you willing to do? And that's the next question. Well, the next, another way to look at it is, what will it take to get you to quit? I think that's a good question for us to ask ourselves as Christians. What will it take for you to just turn away from Jesus and say, I am done with this? That will determine what kind of commitment we have to a faith in a God who became human to dwell amongst us, whose words we have right here. For Job, this was his test. God tested him severely, and he, he would not let go. He lost everything, and even his friends, quote, friends came to him and tried to tell Job, you know, Job, you're the problem. And Job knew, he, he just clung on to what he knew about his God and about the fact that he had always loved uh, God. We need to ask ourselves the question, where is that line? What is that hardship or pain where you say, I quit? This is not to say one does not want to quit. I can't tell you how many times I've said, oh, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm not going back. But it is where commitment to a person, to a cause, to a responsibility is more than life itself. I often think of, uh, think of my mother who, living down in Jai, woke up one morning to find her husband had been killed in a car accident. Looking at five children, I was number one son, I was 10 years old, my youngest brother was two years old, wondering what in the world was she going to do? But her own testimony is, she believed that God had also called her to the mission field. So in spite of her situation, in spite of all the things that were going on, in, in spite of the hardships, she stayed and raised all of us there in Taiwan while continuing on with missionary work. Did she want to quit? Yeah, if you talk to her, she'll say many times. But it's where commitment caused her to, it was more dear than life itself. Because of a deep desire for Jesus, we then, we then decide to, I'm going to deny those things that I want. We do it all the time. Well, we should. It's like a fitness routine. If you desire to, to, to be fit, then you're going to have to work at it. It doesn't happen automatically. If you desire to follow Jesus enough, you will do what is necessary in disciplining yourself, no matter the pain, no matter the effort, and yes, with joy. Christians are defined as people who are hungry for God. Matthew tells us this in chapter five, verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I know when I get hungry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for food. I'm, I know that when I'm hungry, I want to be satisfied. But is there that hunger and thirst for righteousness? The promise is when we are, we shall be satisfied. Most of us don't have that hunger pang. Most of us don't hunger like this. We're perhaps a trifle hunger, hungry for Christ, but we more often pursue the ordinary, the Maslowian values of shelter, food, safety, power, sexual fulfillment. These are all perfectly normal human appetites, but they can become truly dangerous when we lose our mastery over them and allow them to take over our lives. That's a quote from a book by Calvin Miller. It's called The Disciplined Life. I highly recommend the book. 
Actually, I can pretty much highly recommend anything by Calvin Miller, an excellent writer, an excellent public speaker, a pastor, and a preacher. And he writes this book called The Disciplined Life. I highly recommend that to you. You see, the balance for all our appetites is this, self-denial. It's a word we almost choke on, isn't it? I don't want to deny myself. I don't want to do the hard thing. I want to do what I like to do. The world is built upon satisfaction. Don't believe me? Just look at the advertisements, the advertisements. The world is built on trying to get people to get what they think they want. Do what you want. Do it when you want to do it. This philosophy is deeply embedded in our thinking. And therefore, Grace Church, it is well rooted in our church. It's good for ourselves to ask the question, as the body of Christ, are we fit? Are we willing to deny ourselves? Are we willing to be in training? We all know that in life, self-denial is essential. Again, I'm going to quote often from Calvin Miller. He puts things so well. But without self-denial, every eater is a glutton. Without self-denial, every earner is a larcenist. Every lover is a rapist. So at the outset of our call to follow Jesus is his entreaty, stern and yet beautiful. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone will come after me, let him deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. There it is. All fun is gone. Every second helping is done away with. Every grasping desire supplanted with charity. Every sexual fantasy stabbed with moral integrity. Yield to self-denial and marriage endures, for no mates ever cheat, no banker ever embezzles, no addictions ever occur. Sounds pretty sorry to me. However, the athlete, the musician, the person who's in business, the scholar, the parent, the teacher, any one of these who desire to excel in what they do, in their profession or their vocation, everyone has to learn to discipline themselves. Guess what? You got to get up in the morning. You got to brush your teeth. You got to get your clothes on. You got to have something to eat and get out the door and get out what, what you're supposed to be doing. This is, this is a part of our, our self-discipline. The follower and disciple of Jesus Christ also must be dis discipled. And, and so for some reason, we, we fail to recognize the importance of self-discipline and self-denial when it comes to our spiritual lives, when it comes to our following Jesus, when it comes to being discipled. That's where we need to learn the disciplined life. Three things that I, I think that have a very serious hold on us, a very serious grip on us, which can have uh, an adverse control. These things, I think, they, they need to be broken. They must be broken before we can develop the practices and the disciplines that are necessary for an easy yoke. Now, again, uh, these things are taken from this book. This is not an outline that is unique to me by any means, but I'm going to put it in our context here. And these three things, I think, are, are things that we all, we all experience, whoever we are. There's uh, this word called thrall. To be thralled with something is to be under the power of it, to be under the control. So, first of all, we speak about the thrall, <clears throat> or the great power of the sensual, that which feels so good, that which draws us, that which we want so much, why is it so hard then to deny ourselves? Why is it so hard 
then to get on our shorts and put on our t-shirt and put on our trainers and get out there and do a workout or to go running or to put on our gear and go ride the bike or to go to the gym. Why is that so hard to do to deny ourselves? Why is it so hard when we know that we haven't been eating properly, we haven't been taking care of our, our, our health well, and we want to in, in, uh, improve our health? Why is that so hard to do? Because we see denying as quitting rather than desiring. If we could change that, instead of seeing as, a, as quitting and seeing it as desiring what's best for us, it would help us a lot. By focusing on Jesus, we rarely have to quit anything. Why? Because our desire for Jesus prohibits us from starting what we need to quit. What happens is the sensual, captivates us, but it captivates us for an empty endeavor. It captivates us for something that will not give us any satisfaction. This emptiness causes us to fill it with anything that stops our soul from pangs of hunger. This is what our enemy knows. Our enemy knows that he can tempt us to say just Fill this desire, fill this emptiness. You'll be fine then, but it never works that way. When God does not fill the vacuum, a host of consuming appetites swarm through our better intentions. Brilliant people who should be masters of their appetites are at last managed by some dread fiend that was at first unwelcome in their lives, not going to be a part of it. Then his presence becomes customary. Then he becomes habitual. And at last, the fiend, the addiction, and not Jesus, is the master. It doesn't happen immediately. It's by allowing ourselves to be captivated by the sensual, to fill up some kind of emptiness in our life. The difference for what God wants for us and what we become is how we break the thrall of appetites and desires that chain us to ourself so that we can't get out beyond ourselves. The steps to freedom are simple yet so demanding. Focus needs to be on hungry after God. You know, it's odd. If I've missed several meals, or even if I've missed one meal, I begin to feel hungry. If I fast for a few days, I begin to feel even more hungry. And therefore, the desire to eat becomes more demanding. But focus needs to be on hungering after God, what he wants for us, rather than trying to quit what he doesn't want. There's nothing wrong with eating. But there's a, a, a discipline that teaches us to hunger after God and let him fill us with what is going to be totally satisfying. We must live close to the one who enables us, to the one who enables us to be satisfied with him. Our empty existence can only be filled with any lasting effect if it's filled with the very presence of God. You see, we do not intentionally reject God's vision for our life. In fact, we lose the vision simply because of neglect. We just let it go. We just let it go. And that happens, it, it, it shouldn't be unusual to us, it happens so often even in our physical lives. So the first thing that we must face is the thrall and the power of the sensual and allowing God to fill those empty places. Secondly, and this is very important in our age, it's the thrall of things, the thrall of materialism, the thrall of, I need this gadget, I need this thing. It goes on and on and on. Having is, is the cause of the sin of materialism. Having, and I put this in, in uh, quotation marks, having 
is not what God makes possible, but we feel we have achieved and have a right to have. Yeah, I earned that. I have a right to have it. Rather than saying, look, this is something that God has made possible for me to enjoy. Having clutters up our homes, having clutters up our heart, it, it diminishes our faith in the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He isn't enough because I have to have something else in order to have enough. And so, I challenge you, take a little tour through your house. Open up all the cupboards and the cabinets and the closets and see all the stuff that's been gathered from years and it just sits there. And when you're looking for something, you have to go through tons of stuff to go and find it. I understand there's some things that are precious. They're memories. They're things we want to hold on to. But you see, it's this thrall of material things, this, the, the, the thrall of materialism that can keep us then from being free in our fellowship with God. It keeps us from our vision that God has for us. You see, materialism, it's the worldview of those who keep their eyes focused on getting ahead in this world, getting ahead in getting more. Grace is the antidote for materialism. Now, I'm, I, I want you to be careful. Oftentimes when we say grace, we couch it in these spiritual terms and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the free salvation. Grace in the Bible is the Greek word for gift. We don't have to be seeking after things. We don't have to seek after having more because we've been given a gift. That gift is grace. It was given to us freely. It was given to us entirely. And, and so we realize that grace is the antidote to materialism. We break the habit of treasuring our treasures and develop the habit of treasuring the abundance of God's grace. Let me say that again. There's a whole lot of truth in that. We must break the habit of treasuring our treasures and develop the habit of treasuring the abundance of God. Are you in training? Are we discipling ourselves? Are we wanting then the 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 abundance of God's grace? You see, it's the overwhelming wonder of all God has done for us and given to us that washes us with a quiet gratitude, a thankfulness. A rhythm then comes in with its visitations of spiritual plenty. His grace comes and goes furnishing us with everything beautiful in life. Suddenly, we awake to the wonder, and we feel ashamed that we have lived so long never thanking him for his abundance. Folks, I don't know where you are in life. I don't know what your status is, but I can promise you this. God will give you all you need to have. We don't need to be hungering and thirsting for all these other things. He will give us all that we need to satisfy us. And here's the thing that we need to understand about our position in Jesus Christ. We, if we don't want to be under the power of things and more, the thrall of things, we need to understand this truth. And please, listen very carefully. This is the truth that we have been bought. We have been bought with a price. Jesus' ownership of us is more important than our ownership of any mere material whatever. So, there is some training. There is some focusing our attention then on our Master, our Lord, who loves us so much, who gave his own life to purchase us, spilled his own blood that we might be his. His ownership, you see, 
allows us an access to God that results in a wholeness of life, an attitude in life that breaks the material thrall. It's called being disciplined, focusing our attention on the one who has bought us. His love, his mercy, his grace. His grace, it's abundant. It's all there ever is. The verse in the Bible says this, one of my favorite verses, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to all. We need to be broken of the thrall of materialism. And then lastly, consider this. This is also something that we really deal with. Ah, it's a difficult thing in our modern age. It's the thrall of the urgent. Now, I hope that you're enjoying this day. It's a typhoon day here in Taiwan, in Taipei. And I hope that you're enjoying the fact that there's no urgency that you have to be anywhere by a certain time today, and that you can enjoy this time quietly, coming before the Lord in a time of worship and a time of praise. But I'll tell you what, Monday's coming. Monday's coming. And one of the first machines that was ever built was the clock. First, the clock was driven by water, later by spring and pendulum, finally by quartz and dials, and now by a little uh, tiny, uh, what do they call those chips that they stick around now? There's, you know, uh, it remains though, the problem with that is it remains a controlling machine whose tick Tick-tock, tick-tock power leaves us neurotic. <laughs> Clocks were created to make us the stewards of our time, but sometimes end up making us very nervous. Of all the gifts God gives us, surely the most precious is the gift of time, the gift of breath, the gift of health. Surely, uh, as seconds, Minutes, years, they're all life parts, assembled and ready for our use in his service. The sand of our lives is running through the hourglass, fast, steady, precious. It is so precious that when we give it back to God, he sets the angels at their alleluias. Yet we cannot give our entire lives to God at one time and have it done for, for all time. We must surrender second by second. Again, comes from Calvin Miller in his book. What a wonderful way to look at time and, and the fact that our life has to be dedicated. It's not just a one-off thing like, oh yeah, I came forward one day and I dedicated my life to the Lord. Okay, la, I'm done. No, it's second by second, moment by moment. We as humans have this horrible addiction to hurry, to hurry. And you know, I find that day by day, maybe it's particularly in cities where there's large populations and businesses and things have to get done. And you see, we're always under some kind of pressure. You better hurry up and get it done. You better hurry up and get on to work. You better hurry up and do this. You better hurry up and get your homework done. You better hurry up and study. But hurry, hurry, hurry. There's this, this, this fast and hurriedness to life. Jesus understood that time has its limits. Jesus understood that there was a time for everything. Jesus repeatedly warned his disciples a time to begin and a time to end. He told them his time was coming. He knew it all along. We should be looking at our life as in this way, knowing that it's coming to an end. It doesn't matter where we are in life, but that's the fact. Time on earth has its limits. So, there's three words that can describe our life. 
I hope they don't describe your life, but for many people, this is what they are. Hurry, worry, and bury. So often we're caught up with being hurried. That causes us to be worried all the time until we're buried. And then it's over with. You know what we need to do? We need to change time zones. God is meant to be listened to. And yet, most of the time, we want God to listen to us. God, I've got five minutes. I want to spend time in prayer. Are your ears open? You see? He <laughs> we usually do all the talking when it comes to being in God's presence. We usually don't sit still and wait and say, God, what do you have to say to me? When we usually come to prayer, rather than uh, listening to God, no, God, <clears throat> I'm praying now. Just be silent for a bit. Hear what I have to say. We need to change time zones. Ask ourselves the question, who's king? Who's the potentate? Who's the Lord of Lords? Who's the master of the universe? Uh, hang on, I'm talking now, okay? One person talks. Isn't this how it often goes? We must forget who we are when we're talking to God. Let me say that again. We need to forget who we are when talking to God and acknowledge who He is. And by acknowledging who He is, you know what we'll ask? We'll say, what will you have me to do? Rather than saying, God, I have a very busy schedule today. I need you to go with me here, here, there, and there. And I need you to do this, and please help me out here and get this done for me, and, and this kind of thing. No, we forget who we're talking to. Genuine fellowship and communion with God can never be ruled by a clock. The way to change time zones is to fall in love with your Father God. Let me just give you a, a very personal illustration. As you know, I was recently remarried. And I can tell you, there's been a complete change. Ah, once you fall in love with someone, time disappears. We'll be sitting at the table just talking and look at the clock and go, oh my soul, look what, how much time has passed. This it is. The genuine fellowship and communion with God is never ruled by a clock. And when we fall in love with him, we don't pay attention to the time. It takes us away from the hurry and the worry and the bury. So we need to be enthralled with the timelessness of togetherness. The timelessness of togetherness, of praise and worship of only God. To sit quietly in his presence let him speak to us that we might hear what he has to say to us. To be a disciple of Jesus is not to be ruled by the clock, not to be controlled by the tick-tock. A disciplined life is a life that waits on God for the sheer pleasure of his presence. Imagine that. In the presence of God. We need to understand, we're not the owner of our time. We are managers of the gifts and goods that God has given to us. And the ultimate purpose of Jesus' followers is simply to glorify God. And one of the best ways is to be rid of these things that, that control us and simply rest in complete submission to our Father God. We need this practical theology. We need this discipline. The practical theology about our relationship with God is something that we in, in, in helps us in our interaction with God to accomplish his will and his desire. It is the task of these disciplines, of denying ourselves, of these uh, of this practical theology to develop the patterns 
the tendencies, the disciplines, whereby we interact with God to fulfill his intentions. You say, oh, pastor, that just sounds so hard. You, you know, <clears throat> he intends that we should be his disciples, and he intends his disciples to have his characteristics. Just be like Jesus. Rest, be in him. This is where we want to go with this series. It may seem impossible for us. I mean, I've been talking about denying ourselves. We go, ah, I don't know if I can do that. Of course you can't. Of course you can't. The first thing you can do is fall on your knees and say, Lord, I can't do this. The first thing you can do is just come to the cross of Jesus Christ and say, you got to do it, Lord. I'm yours. I'm giving up. This is your life. We simply need to bring our life into line with his, not make him line up with ours. The way to, break our, the way, the way to bring our life into line with his, stop at the cross. Stop at the cross. Pause. Let life slow down. Don't make God line up with you. Fall before him. This is the purpose of the disciplines and the practices of a deeply spiritual life, of living in the presence of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the love and the mercy and the grace that you bestow upon us. You didn't just say, do this and do that. You did it. You gave your life. You came and became one of us. And you sacrificed your life that we then can, like you, simply be a living sacrifice, enjoying your presence, your power, your direction, your leading us. You are God and Lord of Lords, Master. Lord, we yield to you today. We simply lay ourselves before you and ask you, make us into your image. Let us be quiet and listen to what you have for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.